Welcome to the third and final installment of our series of three conversations about the future of the Commonwealth. I'm your host, Victoria Rubadiri. Now, I know that many of you have been part of the previous two events, but for those who are joining us for the first time, this series has been inspired by the 10-year anniversary of the report of the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group, or EPG, on the future of the Commonwealth. Well, that report was a landmark, and its goal was, quote, to shape a truly contemporary organization meeting the aspirations and expectations of the citizens of the Commonwealth. Well, 10 years on, we're here to take stock of the Commonwealth. Of course, we need to look back to examine the performance of the Commonwealth with special reference to the recommendations set out in the report. But we also need to look forward to see the Commonwealth through the lens of our contemporary world with all its hopes, all its possibilities, and all of its challenges. final conversation, we will look to the future and consider whether the institutions of the Commonwealth are fit for purpose. What is our assessment of the institutional strength and relevance of the Commonwealth 10 years after the Eminent Persons Group report? And what are the priorities for change and how can this happen? Who is responsible? first episode of this three-part series, we introduced the big ideas by focusing on what it means to be part of the Commonwealth. Participants discussed what Commonwealth citizenship means to them, and should it mean uh, most especially in terms of tangible connections and benefits that can be felt and enjoyed by all the people of the Commonwealth. They talked about the Commonwealth's values and its uneven record of holding member states to account when those values are violated. Um, in our second episode, we considered the role that the Commonwealth could or should play in the big issues that really matter to the people of the Commonwealth. Participants discussed how the idea of a Commonwealth solidarity played out in our response to the pandemic and how it is playing out in relation to climate change, which is affecting some of our smallest and most vulnerable member states so severely. Now, in this third and final conversation of the series, we want to discuss the future of the Commonwealth, its institutions, and its relevance going forward. Let's meet this formidable panel for this episode. Sir Hilary Beckles from Barbados is a historian and global public voice across issues of social justice and minority rights. He is currently the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies, Chair of the CARICOM Reparations Commission and Advisor to the United Nations. The Honorable Dr. Lawrence Gonzi was the Prime Minister of Malta from 2004 to 2013. He is a longtime participant in Commonwealth Affairs and was chosen by Commonwealth member states to lead the Commonwealth Observer Group to Maldives presidential elections in 2013. Well, earlier, I also had the opportunity to speak with Sir Malcolm Rifkin, a member of the Eminent Persons Group. We'll hear a selection of his comments and the panel's response later in the program. I also had the privilege of speaking earlier to Bogolo Kenewendo from Botswana about the future of the Commonwealth. We'll be sharing an excerpt of our conversation a bit later on. 
Now, we've heard repeatedly throughout this series about the uniqueness of the Commonwealth being tied to its status as a values-based organization. And that's where I bring you in, Sir Hillary, on what that means in a practical sense when we say that the Commonwealth is a values-based organization. Well, I, I certainly would wish uh, Victoria to reflect on that because the Commonwealth certainly has uh, a shared history. Uh, there's no evidence to suggest that there are shared values because within that shared history are some very extreme experiences that different parts of that Commonwealth experience. And, and I, I, would, I would wish to say that those specific experiences have created a very specific geometry, whereas the, the African community might look at the future differently from the, the Canadians or the Australians. And certainly they have a different view to Britain in respect to economic development transformation. So that in your introductory comments, for example, you made reference to climate change and the pandemic. But I note that you didn't make reference to the global reparations movement. Now, for us, uh, this is a trilogy. We do not separate these issues because we believe, and the evidence is clear, that the reparations movement is, is at the moment the most dynamic and transforming political movement in the world because all over the world people are speaking about reparatory justice within the context of those historical crimes that were committed in the antecedent empire that uh, the legacies of which were brought over into the Commonwealth. And those issues are so fundamental. And I did say, you know, at the Durban conference in 2001, when the United Nations brought us together to look at the legacy of the empire, that the reparatory justice movement was going to be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. And uh, it is connected to the issues of climate change. It's connected to how we are experiencing public health crises in respect to the pandemic. All of these are connected. So a shared interlocking history. But the question of values, I think it would be uh, superficial to speak of a, of a linkage of shared values and expectations. And on that note, I'd like to bring in Dr. Gonzi. You know, you witnessed firsthand the in the political workings of the Commonwealth when you were head of state. And bearing that in mind, you know, is the Commonwealth able to do enough when its values are compromised? Yes, uh, Victoria, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, um, greetings to everyone who is following this conversation. I'll, I'll, I'll just make a follow-up comment on what uh, Sir Hillary has just pointed out. I do understand and agree with him that there is uh, this um, <clears throat> repertory, re repertory uh, justice movement, and it's an important topic, which could or should be as um, a, a, an agenda item for the Commonwealth itself to discuss in, in detail and in depth and see what can be done. However, I might add that there are some fundamental values that are shared within the Commonwealth and beyond, um, which uh, I think we can identify. For example, as certainly the Latimer principles of separation of powers, rule of law, um, uh, human rights, we will certainly agree, I, I would submit, that there is a, a shared approach and acceptance of these values, which brings me now to answer the question that has been put to me. Way back when I um, uh, retired, when, when I retired from my active politics as prime minister, Actually, the following year, in 2013, I was asked to follow the elections uh, as an observer, leading a delegation on behalf of the Commonwealth at the Maldives. That was in 2013. A crisis then developed within uh, the Commonwealth, um, within the Maldives, and there were issues that, that literally contradicted the values that uh, I was mentioning as fundamental aspects of the Commonwealth. 
separation of powers, rule of law, um, human rights as well. So that was followed immediately by a, a subsequent delegation, which I always also led with some colleagues of mine, to try and diplomatically uh, and elegantly and uh, in, in a constructive manner to try and discuss with the key players at the time and try to you know, address these issues. Unfortunately, over a period of time, uh, the issue was not solved. And in 2015, um, after a report was submitted to CMAG, uh, the, 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 the CMAG was on the verge of taking a decision to suspend the Maldives. In fact, that didn't happen because the Maldives themselves decided to withdraw their membership in the Commonwealth. Eventually, um, the situation resolved itself, and very recently, in 2020, uh, the Maldives were readmitted. Why do I mention all these details? Simply to point out that perhaps the Commonwealth has this, um, this institution, which is called the CMAG, and what needs to be done, in my opinion, is to see whether it can be a little bit more effective and quick in reaction to similar circumstances. I want to get Sir Hillary's reaction to that in terms of a CMAG. You know, oftentimes the thought is its heyday is behind it. You know, it, it's no longer that um, heavy group and body that would hold countries accountable, and at least to what uh, Dr. Gonzi alluded to. Is that a problem moving forward, and how do we address that? Well, you know, um, I have a challenge with the concept of shared values. I, I certainly do believe that there are shared expectations. But those expectations uh, might represent a framework for action. Uh, the concept of shared values, uh, when tested against, against the history and when tested against the relationships of power, uh, tends to crumble away into an idealism that really cannot be used as a framework for planning the future. Let's face it. The Commonwealth as we know it today, with that shared history, is an institution that rests upon a historical journey in which some of the greatest crimes committed against humanity took place. And those crimes that were committed against humanity in the form of colonization and slavery and white supremacy, racism, and all of those horrendous crimes that have made the world a toxic place today and against which humanity fought for two, three hundred years to rid itself of. All of these legacies have remained today in relationships of power. And so the Commonwealth is uh, a structure and a framework that uh, seeks to bring, I agree, uh, some sense of uh, order around principles of civil rights, human rights, uh, justice, equality. And that's a, that's a commitment that we all must agree to. And I fully support a framework that speaks about shared expectations. But I think to go to the other side to speak about shared values, I think is to, is to deny certain realities. If you consider, for example, the, the democracy movement, which we all would like to imagine to be a shared expectation, you know, the struggle to bring democracy into the 20th century, the struggle against uh, white supremacy globally, whether it was in South Africa and other places, but it has been a horrendous struggle from the, from the bottom, from the black commonwealth, and let's face it, you know, um, the black commonwealth had a struggle to create its own space in the 21st century. And to some extent, the brown commonwealth, but the, the white commonwealth uh, certainly adopted political uh, posturings and relationships that suggested that they were not supportive of this of this humanity uprising for the future. So I think we need to confront those issues and to realize that the, the dream of the Commonwealth has to be about the meeting of minds somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the middle where the, the, the sections of the Commonwealth that continues to enjoy 
uh, the economic benefits of the world, the technology, the science, the economics, living standards, and all of the traditional benefits of privilege has a very different view within the Commonwealth, within the world, to the Black Commonwealth that is still involved in political struggle to bring its humanity to the fore. And this is why the reparatory justice movement that the world is engaging with, the Commonwealth seems to be somewhere in a silent mode. We do not know whether it believes that those people who have been enslaved should be should experience a development plan that is reparatory. Uh, there has been no apologies for the crimes of slavery coming from the white commonwealth. There have been no strategy to assist those peoples whose resources have been plundered for two to three hundred years to regain their economic balance for development. These are the fundamental issues. And let me say this, the climate change matter is a part of that discourse because these poor countries that have been robbed and plundered within the framework of empire and now the commonwealth, these are the countries that are now the most vulnerable to the issues around climate change. And if you take the Caribbean, for example, there is the potential of the Caribbean facing an existential threat. But the Caribbean was also the center of this slavery structure where humanity plunged to its lowest possible level. And so for us, climate change, repartory justice, the pandemics around public health, these are interlocking conversations that continue to show the power relationships within the Commonwealth and the inability of the Commonwealth to speak to the future and the expectation of the majority of its members. With me now is Bogolo Kenewendo from Botswana, a trailblazing economist and politician. Now, until 2020, she served as Botswana's youngest ever minister, occupying the cabinet post of Minister for Investment and Trade, as well as Industry. Bogolo, thank you so much for your time. Now, what do you see as the priorities of the Commonwealth for the future? Thank you very much. The true reflection and reform that is needed for um, all the institutions um, of uh, the Commonwealth really lies on what is the purpose of uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, when we are at Chogham, what is it that we are trying to uh, that we're trying to attain? What is it that we're trying to get out of uh, these meetings? And right now, I feel like it is uh, the opportune moment uh, for uh, the Commonwealth to reposition itself as that uh, vehicle that helps to advocate uh, further for uh, its member states who are largely low income and middle income countries, uh, developing countries that are one in need of liquidity in order to deal with uh, their recovery policies that are too under uh, immense financial um, and fiscal uh, pressures. And three, that are now dealing with the, some of the largest uh, vaccine in inequalities and do not have access uh, to the right um, uh, right cost, right price for vaccines and uh, uh, the right supply. So it would be good to see um, some of these um, committees, meetings of uh, the, the Commonwealth directly addressing issues that matter and not just talking about it, becoming a vehicle towards the delivery of those uh, of those issues and right now it is the time to really show what the commonwealth can do and how it can better serve its member states i'm well aware that uh, the member states are also cutting back on um, uh, on uh, the budgeting and financing for the commonwealth and i think it's because really that value uh, to the member states is lacking and really uh, needs to be um, it needs to be brought forward. We need more concrete 
uh, concrete mechanisms on, of influencing uh, member states. We need more concrete mechanisms of implementing projects uh, within the countries. And I think one of those um, that will really lead uh, the Commonwealth to the future is focusing on economic diplomacy as everybody else is. Uh, how can we build and strengthen the Commonwealth along the lines of economic diplomacy, along the lines of um, equity and not leaving anyone behind and really showing the strength of the members in, uh, um, in the Commonwealth. When I was a, a child, um, we used to celebrate Commonwealth Day and it was quite an occasion and uh, there were speeches and, and so forth. And now, um, because uh, it's relevance in different member states and even at uh, education level has, um, has reduced, you no longer see those celebrations and because celebrations are largely guided um, by what it is that the organization is doing in that country and what it is that the organization is helping with. The things like the Hubs and Spokes program you, that used to help capacitate young people and include them in governments um, throughout the Commonwealth. And those programs have since stopped or uh, they are far and few um, uh, in between. And that is one of the things that has taken away from people seeing the Commonwealth on the ground, uh, even though that even though they still have a bit of technical assistance here and there, um, but it's just not as uh, relevant to economic diplomacy and uh, economic uh, development issues. In the previous episodes, panelists spoke about the successes of the Eminent Persons Report and highlighted the recommendation that laid the foundation for the Commonwealth Charter. Other panelists also shared about opportunities that were missed, including, of course, the proposal for an independent Commonwealth Commissioner on Human Rights, Democracy and the Rule of Law. Sir Malcolm Rifkind, who I spoke with earlier, had some thoughts around this. It is important to point out that he was a member of the Eminent Persons Group and one of the authors of the report that inspired this series. What you're about to hear is Sir Malcolm making some important points about a few other recommendations made by the group that were not taken up by member states. The second of our main recommendations uh, was the one, the most important one that was rejected uh, by the heads of government. We felt that the need for a commissioner uh, was because, uh, not because that commissioner should be somebody who had executive power uh, or who could bully governments or countries, but he should be, he or she uh, should be uh, someone who uh, would have, with the staff they were provided with, which would be a modest staff, but sufficient for their requirements, would be able to monitor what appeared to be any growing risk <clears throat> or very serious breach of rule of law, democracy or human rights in individual Commonwealth states. And their purpose would not be to bully those governments or to put pressure upon them, <clears throat> but to enter into a very early dialogue uh, with the, all the information that they had with those governments uh, to see if through a process of dialogue the risk of uh, these countries falling foul of the commonwealth standards uh, could be uh, avoided. Uh, the committee in its terms of reference and the resolutions of the heads of government had been asked to, and I quote, to examine the format, frequency and content of ministerial meetings in the commonwealth uh, of, of Chogham ministers to ensure that they have added value. Uh, one word for was, for example, to dispense with elaborate opening ceremonies at Chogham meetings. They take up a lot of time, and there only is very limited time. And if you spend time on ceremony, you can't spend time on substance. Uh, secondly, we recommended that you know, all conferences have communiques at the end. But we are suggested that, very politely that the communiques should only be on matters that were actually discussed during the conference. Because what happens, not just with the Commonwealth, but with all international organizations, is ghastly long community communiques covering every possible subject, many of which were not even mentioned by the, the participants at the conference, but nevertheless have to appear in the communique, which reduces its value. And the third was that 
um, that are often at Chogham meetings uh, decided in advance what are called conference themes, what is to be the theme of a particular conference. And we recommended uh, that uh, that actually, uh, when the conference happens of Chogham, if you've already decided themes, that can actually reduce the amount of time available to discuss things that have become much more urgent in the intervening time. Uh, the final point was we said uh, that in order to strengthen engagement between civil society and co the uh, Commonwealth, uh, that there should be meetings between foreign ministers and representatives of Commonwealth civil society in between the Chogham conferences themselves. Uh, you know, there's a several years elapsed between Chogham conferences. Uh, there should be contact between governments and, and Commonwealth civic society during that period so that maximum influence can be heard and can be hopefully responded to. Dr. Gonzi, you know, what's your reaction to what you've heard uh, from Sir Malcolm? And, and more generally, how do you feel now, 10 years down the track, about the report and its recommendations? The points that Sir, Sir Malcolm has, uh, Rifkin has just made are, are important points, of course. Uh, the issue regarding the suggestion, proposal that was made way back, uh, that there should be a commissioner for human rights, um, I think is an extremely positive one. Likewise, all the other suggestions he, that have been made regarding how to upgrade uh, the, the, the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. I had personal experience of this. In 2005, I was Prime Minister and that we hosted Chogham in Malta. And um, uh, I remember very clearly the advantage of having all the heads of government prime ministers meeting in a very informal setting, no media, no journalists, with all due respect, okay, but giving the opportunity to prime ministers to really, you know, speak freely and openly. And um, way back in 2005, um, I remember Malta had just joined the year before the European Union. So we had a situation where Malta, Cyprus and the UK um, had, had, had the advantage of being members of the European Union and members of the Commonwealth. And I remember at the time we had an issue that had arisen because the European Union had just taken some kind of a decision that impacted Caribbean states in particular, but others as well. Uh, it was something to do with the, the product, uh, uh, the agricultural product of Caribbean states, and that was really going to hurt their economy. You know, the advantage of discussing this within this closed group and then deciding on what needed to be done in another um, institution, which was the European Union, that advantage was made available only because we were meeting together as prime ministers at Chogham and had the liberty to speak out and express our opinions um, and, and possible solutions. I point this out because the suggestions that were made with respect to how to maximize on Chogham are, are perfect. However, his final point um, is, I believe, of, of maximum importance, and it ties in with what Sir Hillary was, was explaining earlier on. Um, and I endorse um, everything he said. In other words, if you just take the topic of climate change. So 10 years ago, we did discuss climate change, and the issue was on the agenda, but it was nothing like it is today. And perhaps the biggest challenge of the Commonwealth itself as an institution is whether it is able to bring its member states, its, its presidents, its prime ministers, its ministers, you know, these are the decision makers. These are the decision takers. They are the key people in this, in this organization, in, in this institution, which covers five continents. And I can't believe that it is not possible for, for Commonwealth heads of government to really sit down and come up with proposals that are intimately linked with climate change and the challenges that that creates, especially for small island states, especially for small countries that are so vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change. It is an extremely important topic. What, was, what did Sir Mike Malcolm say? He said, listen, if you simply um, de decide on a theme two years ahead of what this meeting is going to discuss, when in the meantime, climate change has, uh, has exploded over the whole place. In the meantime, you had a pandemic. You had, you, you, you had controversy regarding the distribution of vaccines. You had the larger countries and the richest ones who were 
taking on the, the, the volume of, of vaccines available with the smaller countries and the weakest ones that remained uh, a little bit on the sideline. My point here is, is that the, the Commonwealth and its institutions have a role to play and it can be maximized, it can be leveraged upwards. And I think the suggestions made by Sir Malcolm should be taken on board. Um, but of course, taking into consideration that 10 years has have passed since the uh, eminent persons group uh, report, and that needs to be updated for sure. An endorsement there from Dr. Gonzi. You know, Sir Hillary, you look eager to respond. So where do we go from here in terms of the direction, uh, in terms of focus and priorities for the Commonwealth? Well, you know, I like to begin uh, uh, on the basis of fundamental truths that are derived from, from sound research. Uh, my profession as an economic historian, which, which links historical perspective to the economic development challenges faced by nations, would tell me that uh, I should respect the integrity of uh, Sir Malcolm's point about human rights. However, the reality within the Commonwealth and the conversations that are really germane to what he just said is that he was speaking fundamentally to the issues of, of human rights looking forward, looking into the future. But from a Commonwealth perspective, from the Caribbean perspective, for example, we would want to have as well a conversation about human rights violations in the past. We cannot speak, we cannot speak about the imperative of human rights violations in the future unless we also acknowledge that uh, if there are current tendencies towards human rights violation, those tendencies are rooted in a historical pattern, a historical process, and a historical determination where human rights were violated in the Commonwealth in a way that we have probably seen outside of the Commonwealth. And so let's face the fact. The biggest challenge for the majority of the Commonwealth nations is nation building. The majority of the members of the Commonwealth are still in the infancy of the nation building process. And the black nations of the Commonwealth are still in the formative stages of nation building. And within this nation building experience, what they really are doing is largely cleaning up the colonial mess that was a part of empire. So the, the burden of nation building brings with it relationships of power that the Commonwealth has systematically refused to address in, the order, in an orderly fashion. If you consider, for example, that in the Caribbean, where in the British Empire really in fact started in earnest, in the Caribbean, there are still colonies. And despite the fact that the United Nations as early as the 60s argued that we should bring colonization to an end, in the Caribbean, we still have colonies. We still have countries, uh, nations, communities that are ruled directly by Britain and where the people are classified as colonials, not having citizenship in their own countries. So we still have the burden of colonization in the Caribbean. And the Commonwealth is presiding over colonizations of Caribbean peoples. Now, I'm sure Lawrence would agree that when Malta went off into its nation building experience and all of the enthusiasm in his country, what the economic history also shows is that Malta received substantial development support from Britain to launch its own development in the formative stages. And we know this to be true. We also know it to be true that Britain also participated in something called the, the, the Colombo Plan. The Colombo Plan was a strategy by Britain to help the countries of Asia, the colonies of Asia, to move from colonization to post-colonization and to get some support for infrastructure for development and so on. And so 
the white commonwealth received funding to support their early nation building projects. The brown commonwealth also received the Colombo plan that was rolled out between 1950 and 1953. But the black commonwealth received nothing. In fact, the Caribbean was asking for the same kinds of development support that Malta received. The Commonwealth was at, the Caribbean was asking for this kind of support. But, you know, we were the post-slavery part of the Commonwealth. And now we are in the position where we are pushing for reparations because we are saying that the same support that the Asian colonies received and Malta received, the Caribbean had a right to receive. So when you speak of the inequality of history and the differential treatment, what you are saying are the legacies of this situation playing out in front of us. So the notion of the Commonwealth with shared values is absolutely when tested against the historical data. It is not true. There might be, and I think there is, a shared expectation, but there certainly are not shared values. And to the extent that we are pushing all for democracy and human rights and civil rights, we are pushing from different di directions. This climate change crisis has seen a flat-footedness within the Commonwealth in respect to the Caribbean. Islands are shrinking. Communities and beaches are disappearing. We can see it in front of us day by day the diminishing and the shrinking of the physical Caribbean as a result of rising uh, sea levels. We can see communities' infrastructure being destroyed because, again, of rising sea temperatures and sea levels and the impact upon the marine environment. And in comes COVID, and we see, again, a double circumstance the marginalization of the Caribbean in terms of its capacity to fight a public health camp, uh, pandemic, suffering the physical effects of the climate change, and at the same time calling for development support that other parts of the Commonwealth had received and the Caribbean had not received. So I will say to Lawrence, you know, looking at this history and this present and this future from a Caribbean perspective, what we are seeing in the Commonwealth is an ethical crisis, an ethical crisis around equality, an ethical crisis around shared values that really are being threatened every day, an ethical crisis around the power of economic development to maintain the marginalization of those countries that were ravished by slavery and colonization. So I think we need to step back and say, how can we, how can we create a commonwealth against the background of all of this, that we can all say, listen, this is an institution that we all care about. It has tremendous potential to heal many of these wounds of history. It has tremendous potential to unite a critical part of the world around values that should be shared, that should be shared. So I am a great supporter of the Commonwealth, but I'm also a great critic of the Commonwealth because it continues to refuse to live up to the reality as we have researched it, as the knowledge has become available. We can see the inequalities. We can see the marginalization of the historical communities. We still see colonization in some parts of the Commonwealth. And there is silence around these issues because there is a power relationship between those communities that benefited from empire and those communities that were the victims of it. I have to ask a follow-up to that, uh, Sir Hillary, uh, as we usher into the last part of the conversation on making change happen, that tangible change. You know, How can we reshape the institutions of the Commonwealth to better serve the idea of shared values, which you say it, as it stands are shared expectations, and, and really dismantle the colonial legacy that still exists in very many parts of the Commonwealth? Let's face it, the Commonwealth has this mass of poverty at its base, a mass of marginalization at its base. And these are the challenges that the 21st century uh, will deal with. The 21st century is becoming very impatient of these historical relationships. The, the 21st century, especially the century for young people, they are saying, 
all of these things that have shaped the last two to three hundred years, we want a 21st century that is based on social justice, that is based on social equality, level playing fields. We want a democratic 21st century. We want a 21st century where the marginalized can be given the opportunities. So the Commonwealth has to realize that it is still the embodiment of an old world, but it is not yet rising to represent the new world. And it is therefore at a crossroads, because I can tell you this, there is no carpet in the world that is big enough to brush these problems under. These problems cannot be brushed under a carpet. There's no carpet big enough. They must be brought to the surface, a structural conversation, a conceptual conversation, and the Commonwealth has a tremendous opportunity to shape the 21st century. And it has many foundations on which to do so. But critically, it can look at the challenges that are facing the majority of its citizens, confront them and deal with them within a framework of justice, economic development. That is the only way we can guarantee democracy and freedom in the 21st century. Dr. Gomzi, to avoid this lump under the carpet, as Sir Hillary had put it, you know, let me move on to the renewal um, of genuine of, of the institutions within the Commonwealth. For example, a different model for Chogham, uh, a commissioner for human rights that had been put in the report, um, or even a commissioner for the environment. Uh, where do you see some of those changes happening? I I see them. I see them as major uh, steps forward for the Commonwealth to uh, to really follow what 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 was written again ten years ago, um, nine years ago in the charter that had been approved at the time. Uh, I have the here in front of me the concluding paragraph of the charter of the Commonwealth, which states. We are committed, and well, the we is all the member states uh, forming part of the Commonwealth. It's not just one side, the strong, the, the strong side and the weak side, the big uh, members and the small members. This is the whole group saying that we are committed to ensuring that the Commonwealth is an effective association, responsive to members' needs, and capable of addressing the significant global challenges of the future. This concluding paragraph summarizes really uh, and answers the, the, the strong point that has been made by Sir Hillary. In other words, if, if the Commonwealth is, is indeed an effective association, and uh, we've just mentioned that during this conversation climate change and the impact of climate change, and we've mentioned as well, mind you, the pandemic and the vaccines, etc. Um, I, I would like to point out that that is a discussion, a conversation that doesn't limit itself only to the unfairness that we've witnessed in the distribution of vaccines. There, is a, there, there are a number of economic corollaries linked to this issue, because what is going to happen now, the weaker members, the weaker states, the weaker countries that uh, have enormous national debt and had enormous national debt prior to the pandemic are now facing a situation where um, the, 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 the challenges in order to address that debt and to repay loans and, 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 and whatever and, and the responsibilities um, pre-pandemic and now post-pandemic, that is going to create havoc. And if uh, I personally uh, um, would, would certainly uh, suggest that the, the, the institution, the, the the Commonwealth as we know it today, and as it has operated over the past years, needs to address all these issues by revising its priorities and focusing its energies in order to address these inequalities that Sir Hillary has just pointed out. Of course, it's a, it's a tough agenda. It's a major challenge. It requires the contribution of all members of the Commonwealth. Um, Certainly, proposals to have a commissioner uh, for human rights is, is, is a step forward, in my opinion. To have a commissioner for the environment is another step forward. But the bottom line, Victoria, is can we translate all of this into concrete action that addresses the social injustice and inequalities 
that we are witnessing today. Sir Hillary obviously rightly points out to the past and the injustices of the past. I understand perfectly what he says. Malta, in a way, um, lived through a period of time when, when we were uh, very important because of our strategic position in the Mediterranean. Second World War, Malta's role was fundamental. Um, uh, and, and the strategic location of, of my country was, was, was utilized in the best interests of, um, of the empire at the time. But, but, but that needs to be addressed at the same time that we have to address as well the, uh, the legacy that we are still living today because of the inequality that is creating s tremendous disadvantages for small countries. The Caribbean is one, one part of it, but, but, the, but, but there are other countries that are facing major difficulties in Africa, etc. Um, and I mean, all of this is, is, is so, so fundamental, which means, in short, the Commonwealth has a role to play. I am personally a, a strong supporter of the Commonwealth. In my time as Prime Minister, I benefited from the, uh, the membership of Malta in the Commonwealth. I, uh, we benefited because of the contacts we had. We benefited because of the support we received uh, in, in expertise that we required in order to address, for example, the issue of provision of water and lack of water on the island. Um, and, and how to address this technologically. We got the expertise. We found support on a number of areas. But you see, it's, it's a process. It's a process that requires the, com the whole Commonwealth to understand that, that now there are priority areas and there is no longer time just to discuss the issue. We really need to come up with practical solutions that address what the Charter says. The needs of, of, the, of, the, mem of the peoples, of the people, within the whole Commonwealth and, be, and have an organization that is capable of addressing the, the, the challenges of the future. Actually, the challenges of today and not the challenges of the future. Fantastic insights. Thanks to all of today's speakers, Sir Hilary Beckles from Barbados, Honorable Dr. Lawrence Gonzi from Malta, Bogolo Kenuendo from Botswana, and Sir Malcolm Rifkind from the UK. This has been a fantastic panel. It's been a delight for me to moderate these three discussions. The team at the Commonwealth Foundation deserves our special thanks for the work they put in behind the scenes, and the Commonwealth Foundation itself deserves some words of gratitude as well for the role it has taken on providing the space and the place for the people of the Commonwealth to discuss and to debate what is after all their organization to help shape a Commonwealth for the future. I believe this is a series that has given real insight into why the foundation, the people's pillar of the Commonwealth, I might add, is so important to this organization's identity. Well, the task of summing up the three compelling events is not an easy one. And I believe that we must continue to discuss, to challenge, to debate, to push for change. While the value of our Commonwealth is well established, so too is its potential to become something much more. And the future of the Commonwealth and the ideals it stands for in our hands. Let's take that challenge and run with it, shall we? Well, to everyone who has followed this series and participated in whatever capacity, thank you for joining us, for listening, and for being part of what we can only hope serves as the beginning, not the end, of the evolution of our Commonwealth. Goodbye. <laughs>